I have to find the correct thing. Hello, everyone. No, 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 that's not it. Well, welcome to the series on knot theory. And today's speaker is Scott Carter, who is going to introduce himself and uh, how yeah. he's living. <laughs> uh, the view is from my uh, living room, but I'm in my, um, I'm currently in my, uh, uh, in my study. Uh, and let's see, have we shared the screen now? That looks good. Okay, and we're going to go to full screen mode. And uh, yes, I'm living in Austin, Texas. Uh, okay. So, um, Siichi Kamada and I uh, just finished a book. We uh, have sent it to the publisher, and uh, some of you may be reviewers, so please be, please be kind. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, chapters six and seven mostly, with a smattering of chapter eight. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about isotopic classes of embedded surfaces in three space as a four category. Um, Obviously, thanks are also due to Masahiko Saito, who um, was there from the beginning as we developed this material. Um, and uh, obligatory acknowledgments in 2018-2019, uh, I was an international research fellow supported by JSPS with that grant number. CEG has been supported by these grants. And in the fall, I was supported by ISER. And now I'm supported by the chair that I'm sitting upon. Okay, the original result that isotopic classes of embedded surface form a certain three, four category has been known for some time, uh, circa about 1990. Um, and at, at around that time, uh, people realized that since the free braided monoidal category on one self dual object generator was the category of tangles. People were looking for a corresponding statement about the category of two tangles. That statement was formulated in John Fisher's PhD thesis. There was a gap in that thesis that was patched by Baez and Langford. And uh, then Baez and Dolan formulated the tangle hypothesis and the cobordism hypothesis. And so uh, I'm not sure whether I'm talking about the Tangle hypothesis or the Kabordism hypothesis here, but it's found in their tables. So people have known this result since then, uh, but uh, there doesn't seem to be a nicely written down proof of it. Maybe including our book, we'll see. Um, so I'm gonna start out with general categorical philosophy. I'm gonna show you how to envision higher order categories uh, we're going to talk about, about a particular higher order category that has two objects and two arrows between them. Well, there are lots of arrows between them, but they're generating arrows. And we want to compare doing followed by undoing with not doing in a lot of different cases. And then we'll talk about why we have certain particular triple arrows, certain quadruple arrows. And we'll generalize the category that we get to a whole host of categories, um, all topological, and then uh, we'll finish up talking about classical knots as a multi-category. So the general categorical principles are, uh, first of all, different things are not equal. If they're not equal, then you should compare them, and the arrows are a means of comparison. So arrows in a category, any arrow in a compare category is a method to compare uh, two things that may or may not you may or may not think are equal. Uh, <clears throat> in this sense, doing followed by undoing is comparable to not doing. Sometimes doing followed by undoing is the same thing as not doing. And sometimes it's not. And if it's not, then you have an arrow to compare. Uh, <clears throat> a principle that I'd like to articulate is that simultaneity is illusory. Uh, that's particularly difficult to do now since we're all in different time zones and we all seem to be here now. But um, from a uh, categorical perspective, we don't allow two, article, two particles to have the same space at the same time. 
Um, exchange followed by change is comparable to change followed by exchange. That's a statement about the right of Meister type three move, as we'll see. And um, <clears throat> so those are gonna be the guiding principles in what I'm doing. Um, a small category consists of a set of objects such that between any two objects, A and B, there's a set of morphisms or arrows, and we'll write that as a set of arrows. Um, if we have um, arrows G with source B and target C and F with source A and target B, so that the source of G is equal to the target of, a, target of F, then their composition is an arrow with source A and target C. Uh, composition of arrows is associative, and for any object, there is an identity arrow, and that identity arrow behaves as an identity under composition, as indicated in the last slide. Okay, so that's what a category is, that rather that's what a small category is. Of course, a category, uh, we don't restrict the collection of objects to be a set. I'm only interested in places where the collection of objects is a set, so I'm gonna be very cowardly about that. Um, <clears throat> Here's a rough definition. An N category is one for which the collection of arrows forms an N minus one category. So a one category, the arrows form a set. In a two category, the arrows form a category. And in a three category, the arrows form a two category and so forth. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> one of the subtleties in that definition is how did the various categories play together under composition? And we'll talk about that. So it's common to assert that there are identities between compositions of arrows. So it's, as you know, people will say that the diagram commutes. The important thing about this diagram is that there's a source object and a target object for both the collection of arrows that run along the bottom and the collection of arrows that run along the top. Um, but if you don't, if you, for some reason you can't see that those two collections of arrows are the same, then you may want to uh, compare them. And if you compare them, you compare them by means of a double arrow. You may want that collection of arrows to be isomorphic in which the double arrow is the isomorphism. And then there may be another double arrow that goes from top to bottom. Double arrows are composed globularly and uh, a globular comp composition is indicated here at the bottom of the screen. That's a globular composition of G with F. The target of G is F naught, which is G1. All the arrows, all the one arrows have common source and targets. And then we also draw uh, the, we replace this composition of arrows with single arrows. And uh, there's one more thing that I'd like to be able to do. And that is, at liberty, I want to be able to uh, insert identity one arrows. So I can draw this globular composition, uh, just pad the one arrows with identity arrows. And here, I'm saying that the target of F0 is the target of F1. So here I am uh, breaking my first rule, which, is, which will often happen. Um, and what did I do? OK, right. So um, one of the things that you can do when you have a collection of, say, target arrows, more than one target arrow, you can amalgamate all but some of them into one one arrow and then all but the rest of them into another one arrow. And you can amalgamate all the source one arrows into a single arrow. And then you have this up pointing F um, or alternatively, uh, you can have a down pointing F. Sorry, the Fs are always point up, but the, uh, the uh, notation uh, up and down in Chinese characters is just to indicate that the vertex of the triangle is pointing up or down. And so you amalgamate a bunch of the one arrows and then some more of the one arrows and then compare that with a full composition. Um, <clears throat> there's a reason that I want to do that and I'll get to that reason in a moment. In both, both the up and down cases, uh, I'm sorry, can you see what's on the right-hand side of the screen here? There, that's better. I had to put you all out of the way if we have the faces there. So um, 
Over here, we have a down kind of F, and then we just replace that with a rectangular diagram, or an up kind of F, and we replace that with a rectangular diagram. And the reason that this is important is that we want to be able to form skew compositions. And <clears throat> the point is that um, just with these triangles, you could glue them together willy-nilly, but you need to have a well-defined source and target in these cases. And so when you do have a well-defined source and target, so you need to have the composition of one arrows along one side of the polygonal region that you have be something that you would call a source and the other composition of one arrows could be something that you call a target. And you should also declare a, a direction for these things. That can be very tricky. At any rate, uh, there are ways of forming skew compositions and the way you form skew compositions is by uh, augmenting the given two arrows by appropriate one arrows. We'll see this again. Um, we can also write those skew compositions just as uh, gluing triangles together. And uh, it's a really tedious exercise that you can do it. You can just take, say, one capital F and figure out all the different ways you can glue other triangles on there and then figure out that there are only these ways other than the globular compositions where you get a well-defined source and target so that there's there's a source object, a target object, a source one arrow, and a target one arrow. What I don't want to allow is um, uh, this composition of double arrows here. And uh, the best way of thinking about that is if you have a parenthesized product A times B times C times D, then um, even though it doesn't matter whether you multiply A times B first or C times D first, you do make a choice. So you make a choice and then stick with it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a choice that G occurs first, we augment G by an identity on the source of F, and we augment F by the identity on the target of G, and then that will replace this horizontal composition. And you say, why do it that way? Well, you don't have to. You could do it the other way by augmenting in the other fashion. And then you can declare that there is a triple arrow which relates those two things. And the triple arrow should satisfy certain axioms. Uh, the axioms that it's going to satisfy are indicated over here. So here we start with uh, G below F. If we exchange their positions, and then change F to H, that would be the same as changing F to H and then exchanging G and H. So this is change followed by exchange is comparable to exchange followed by change. And stop, stop. Um, those tiny di those diagrams, we can't read the tiny letters in there. Oh, you don't need to. I don't need to, okay, fine. Yeah, I mean, they're, ju they're just indicators of which, is, which are sources and targets. Uh, it's just bookkeeping. You can read the, the, the uh, sans serif characters here, yes? Just about. <laughs> um, oh my. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, Hang on. Hang on. Don't worry. It, in, in, ge in general, uh, I'll be... I'll get my um, reading glasses on. <laughs> in general, I won't be using... Um, uh, Roman fonts uh, to any extent, um, and we'll try to have bigger fonts. Um, at any rate, uh, the other axiom about the exchanger is that it should be strongly invertible in the sense that if you go ch exchange and then exchange back, then uh, that's the same thing as doing nothing. So here we have doing followed by undoing is the same as not doing, and that's an expression of the writer Meister type two move. And then on the bottom left, we have um, uh, exchange followed by change is the same thing as change followed by exchange. And the exchange in this case is between two strings. The change is another exchange. Okay? Can you read that? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So um, fear not, I'm going to read it to you. Sorry. 
uh, we have two objects, F and T. We're going to start out with a category. It's a multi-category. It's going to have two objects, F and T, and it'll have generating arrows, P and B. There'll also be identity arrows from F to F and from T to T. And we'll uh, say that P and B are reverses of each other. And in general, a uh, non-identity arrow is a raspberry, starting with P and ending with B, or starting with P and ending with P, starting with B and ending with B, and starting with B and ending with P. So any, any sort of raspberry that sound that you can make is going to be a composition of one arrows and the identities have all been contracted. The double arrows are going to be comparisons and the comparisons are gonna go like this. So we start with the identity upon F and compare that with a composition PB and that'll be that comparison will be in double arrow which will be upside down f of f there's another comparison which is right side up f of f which compares in the reverse order and then there's a similar comparison for t's uh, in addition we have identity uh, double arrows as indicated here and then you just post you paste these planar diagrams together uh, as long as you get sources and targets matching up appropriately. So we have objects T and F, one arrow is generated by P and B, uh, generating two arrows that compare P, B, and B, P, sorry, I said it in the wrong order, uh, to the identities. And um, I don't know what I'm writing here because the you, you all are in the way. I think I, oops, sorry. Uh, now I've gone all haywire. I think I said that I had identity arrows there. Okay, so we also have the rectangular descriptions of these. And um, in this situation here, uh, I want to focus just upon F of T. So F of T is the comparison of BP with the identity on T. Alternatively, you can think about this as this arch that goes upward from B and then downward at P. And here, always B and P are um, right pointing arrows. So the up, down, right, left, right conventions are going to stay like that. And then um, in this case, we're going to uh, just form all compositions of that F of T with anything that we can. So here's uh, F of T and then upside down F of T. We can compose them this way. This is a globular composition along BP. Uh, there's another depiction of that. We can form a uh, delta nabla composition along the identity of T, and we can form skew compositions as indicated here. And that's all that we can do with F of T. So, um, okay, that's, and there are similar compositions for the other three Fs, capital Fs. Okay. Uh, but the thing to notice here is that the source of this double arrow is P, the target is P. The source of this is, the target of this is B. The source is B. The source double arrow, the source single arrow is BP with target BP and here the source is the identity on T and the target is the identity on T. So we're going to compare each of these with a certain identity double arrow. And that'll give us our triple arrows. And the triple arrows are going to be a positive death. So we start out with this globular composition and compare it with the identity upon the identity on T. And that will be, uh, you can think about that as the death of this red simple closed curve. It's positive because if we look at it from this side, looking at the morphism, the one arrow that we see most predominantly is P. Okay, we have a positive birth, uh, which is just the reverse of the previous triple arrow. We have a negative death and a negative birth. Okay, so those are all the comparisons that we can make with that type of globular composition where the uh, composition is along those two arrows, either PB or BP. Okay, um, <clears throat> we have a positive fork. 
a positive saddle, a negative fork, and a negative saddle, and those are going to be comparisons with the delta nabla compositions and then the identities on the composition PD. And um, the terminology fork uh, was reported uh, in a uh, fine movie about Laden Wainwright III, where he's reading essays from his father, who uh, used to write uh, wonderful uh, essays. I think it was in Looker Life magazine when we all were children. And uh, Laden Wainwright Jr. went to Savile Row to get a proper suit made, and then the tailor discussed how the pants fit in the fork of the pants. And so we need to make a distinction between forks and saddles. So uh, I hope that you can imagine that there's a saddle here and then there's a fork here. Okay. Uh, now, when we form skew compositions, we get cusps. And uh, these are the eight types of cusps. They are left, right, up, down, positive, and negative. And I think that makes eight. Um, and uh, what happens here is uh, this slightly thicker line indicates that this hump, if you turn the picture sideways, that hump is going to be on the right. Okay? Um, positive and negative, uh, up and down cusps. And uh, let's look at what the axioms of these things are going to be. So oh, before we look at the axioms, let's just recap. We have two objects, F and T. We have positive, a positive arrow from F to T and a bad arrow from T to F. You can think about F as being from and T as being to. So it's good to go from to to, but it's bad to go to to from. And uh, these are reverses. And I'll tell you what I mean by weak inverses in a little while. The objects F and T, the identities upon them, and the arrows P and B form a category, generate a category. And since these P and okay, so what I mean by P and B being, being weak inverses is precisely that there are these uh, two reverse pairs of generating double arrows that are also pairwise weak inverses. And um, there's a word here, sesquicategory. Sesquicategory uh, gets me out of the realm where I have horizontal compositions of double arrows. Okay, so we're going to allow them to be decomposed globularly in a skew fashion, but horizontal compositions are mitigated by uh, exchangers. And uh, since the various Fs are weak inverses, then, they, then we have burst, death, settles, and fork triple arrows, and we also have the eight cusp-like arrows that we had before. And triple arrows are going to be composable in a globular and skew fashion. So um, the triple arrows are um, birth, death, saddle, fork, cusps, and also exchangers, which we haven't really seen yet. Okay, so now we need to talk about how we would like to think about things as being same, the same. Of course, they're not the same, but we're going to declare them to be naturally isomorphic. And so this is one of the first instances of this quadruple arrow. Anytime we have a movie, the movie is going to be a composition of triple arrows, and then an, a movie move will be quadruple arrows. And so um, there's a way from getting from this triangle to this basketball arena. Uh, and then there's a way from getting from the basketball arena to this um, uh, free, free throw, throw shot here. And uh, one of the ways you can get there is you can go from the bottom to the next step by means of a birth arrow. And then you can go from the next step to a, by means of a fork. And then you see that the source double arrow and the target double arrow correspond with upside down f of f. And so you can compare that composition with the identity on upside down f of f. Alternatively, you could get from here to here by means of a saddle and then get from here to here by means of a death. So the movie has an ambiguity in here unless we label these things by means of uh, fork, birth, and saddle death. Sorry, birth, fork, and saddle death. Um, 
And then there are eight instances of this, and those are all critical cancellations. So we have birth fork is equal to an identity, or death saddle is the same identity. Or we have um, fork, fork, sorry, saddle death, or um, fork birth. And uh, <coughs> It's tedious to go through the names of all of those things. Diagrammatically, these are all, all the same things. And uh, to satisfy Colin a little bit, the label on the green curves just tells me whether that's an identity on one of the variants of the Fs, uh, either a positive, an <coughs> right side down F of F or of F or of T. Okay, so uh, these are going to be quadruple arrows. <coughs> um, the cusps are going to be strongly invertible. And for the cusps to be strongly invertible means that if you do one and then undo it, that's the same thing as an identity. In this case, I've shown you this particular uh, glyph glyphographic, glyphographic picture. On the left-hand side, we have a down-left negative cusp, and then we have an up-left negative cusp, and that composition is the same as the identity on the identity on B. Okay, so there are four of those lips, moves, but we can compose those things in an opposite order. So we can compose uh, from the this parallelogram picture to this rectangular picture, that would be an up cusp. And then um, if we compose with an up cusp and then a down cusp, that would be the same as the identity on this particular double arrow and that this movie move corresponds to this uh, beak to beak uh, relationship okay um horizontal cusps are difficult to understand um uh i keep trying to find one in nature looking at uh say a, an alcove with an arch and i think they're there but I haven't really put my finger on one, so we'll just have to see it in the mathematical realm. So at the bottom, in the bottom, to go from the bottom still to the next still, uh, we do that by means of a saddle, and then we have a cusp up, or we can do a cusp down followed by a fork. So we have saddle cusp up is fork cusp down, and um, these are all of the horizontal cusps. So this is just a catalog of these moves, um, and they're all of the form cup, wedge is equal to cap, V. And uh, this equation is extremely elegant. I love this equation because it has, if you take this and apply the dihedral group to this, rectangle, you'll get all the variations on the horizontal cusp. Uh, see it again. Those are how the horizontal cusps are written. If you want to write, write that in the more algebraic notation, you get one of these equations. And if you want all the rest of the re relations, flip that, rotate it, do whatever you like. OK, um, swallowtails. Uh, swallowtails, we start here. We introduce a cusp. Now we're going to have an exchanger. So you see this trapezoid, I'm not allowed to write with this identity on F along the horizon because that would put these two double arrows at the same level. So I have to tilt it. I choose a tilting and then I exchange the tilting. And then after I exchange the tilting, I do a cusp in another order. And that's comparable to doing nothing. And so uh, this, these are uh, swallowtail relations. Um, that, that you see. And I'm not going to try to figure out which swallowtail relations, which swallowtail relation that we've seen here. There are eight such things. Okay. Um, if you think about um, matrices and you think about um, uh, taking the dot product or an inner product of two matrices, um, you can say they're, inver they're inverse matrices. You can realize the swallowtail relation, uh, particularly in that matrix fashion. It can be done. It's done in the book. 
it's not that difficult. Um, the last relationship that we need is naturality of the exchanger. Here the exchanger is a triple arrow and the exchanger occurs among folds that are in different places. Here Q is either a birth, death, saddle, fork, or cusp, in which case it has no, uh, on the left it has no outputs, on the right it has no inputs. And so uh, these completely describe all the relations of the naturality of the exchanger. And it's not supposed to be any surprise that the terminology for the triple arrows was meant to suggest what happens when you take a surface in three space, project it into two space, and make sure the projection is generic and all the critical points or, uh, uh, yeah, all the critical points or cusps are at distinct level or exchanges are all at distinct levels. Okay. I trust that this picture requires no further explanation. Okay, so a homogeneous triple arrow is one, well, I'm, I think I'll skip this definition. We just wanna make sure that everything is the same on the outside of the triple arrow. And here's the theorem. Uh, take a surface embedded in R2 cross I. Uh, you can decompose the boundary into two pieces. Either one of those pieces may be empty. They both may be empty. They don't have to be connected, uh, but they have to be properly embedded so that the knot piece is at the knot level and one piece is at the one level. And then this is going to correspond to a globular composition of hom homogeneous triple arrows and S. Properly isotopic surfaces correspond to equivalent homogeneous triple arrows, and given a globular composition of homogeneous triple arrows, you can, you can get a properly embedded surface, and equivalent triple arrows give rise to properly isotopic surfaces. And going back to our illustration, what we do is we cut the illustration around where the blue ellipse is, and then uh, Look at how that's cut. So at the bottom of the blue ellipse, we have this oval, which corresponds to this bit here, and then we have the circle, which corresponds here. And then uh, we gradually move up the critical level. So we moved up here by a fork, we moved up here by a cusp, we moved up here by a cusp, and then we moved up there by means of a fork. And then uh, it looks like we're labeling the outside with T, so I think we all want to go outside, so that would be where we're going to. And um, then we label the inside with F. So we can black and white color the complement of the surface. And then anytime we draw across a vertical segment, that's going to correspond to an identity on either P or B. The cups and caps are going to correspond to our various capital Fs or upside down Fs. And so you can go from this surface to this composition. If you have this composition of triple arrows properly labeled, you can recreate the surface uh, from the glyphography of the, uh, of the triple arrows. Okay, why these three and four arrows? Well, the reason I mentioned earlier, these are, if we just look at this uh, double arrow F of T, there, these are the only ways that we can form compositions of that double arrow with any other double arrow and get a meaningful source and target. These are the only ways that we can form triple compositions. And so um, we're ju we just look at the triple compositions and try to figure out how to resolve those triple compositions. Okay. I didn't tell you what T and F were, right? They can be anything. And if they're anything, then we can relate them. Here, uh, we actually thought about F as being non-existence and T as being existence. And we're appealing, Lou, to um, uh, uh, the laws of form. So we, our arrows go from from to two. These are just simple laws of form type things. In P and B, then correspond to units and co-units. Uh, we could let P and B be uh, co-multiplication and multiplication, in which case F is one dot and T is two dots. We could start with two dots and go to nothing. 
We could start with a circle and go to nothing, in which case P is a death and V is a birth. Uh, we can go from straight strings to cup cap, in which case P and B are saddles and forks, uh, and so forth. And uh, it would take quite some time to go through what all the relationships are in, this, in these cases, but we're going to uh, spot a few out. So let's look in the case that T is one dot and F is two dots. Then um, P and B are Y and lambda. And then birth, these are our positive births, positive and negative births and death. Uh, the negative death is when you kill a piece of bubble wrap. Uh, the negative birth is when you blow it up. Uh, here you have these two sheets thinking, sticking together and then ungluing them. Um, and the saddles and forks are just connecting channels among these uh, different things. Uh, the critical cancellations really are critical cancellations in this case, and the horizontal cusp is this type of move here. Okay, so let me just recall the standard pictures. I won't go through this too long. We have these capital F of T, upside down F of T, capital F of F and upside down F of F. You, if you don't like the Fs, then you can think about them as cups and caps with uh, upward or down or counterclockwise or clockwise pointing arrows. Um, the positive and negative bursts, I want to write these in this fashion. So you go from the identity on F to this composition, or you go from this composition to the identity F, similarly for the identity on T. For our forks and saddles, you start out with this identity, you go hither and yon, uh, you go hither and yon, or go the other way, and then you have your forks and saddles. The cusps, uh, these are all the, all the possible cusps. Um, they're just listed in a single slide here. And um, the nice thing about this picture is you can use them to imagine both the lips and beak to beak four arrows. So if you want to see beak to beak, then you start here, go here, and then go back. And then you see the iconography is saying, do this first and then do that. And then you have the beak to beak um, glyphography suggested there that this should be comparable to the identity on that. For the lips, you start here, go here, and then back. So you go up this triple arrow and then back along the other triple arrow, and that's the same thing as remaining static. Of course, you could reverse those and make these be the lips to beaks to, and beaks to beak. So uh, the order in which you compose things uh, does matter here. Um, and in all these cases, doing followed by undoing is the same as not doing. Okay, so let's look at critical cancellation. Uh, the only thing that I need to uh, see for critical cancellation is either this picture or this picture. And the reason is that once you see that picture, you can realize that it's comparable to uh, 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 one of the Fs as indicated. Uh, in this case, it's comparable to an upside down F. And uh, there's an ambiguity in this picture, so we can either get uh, through those by means of birth or fork or death and saddle. Um, if you want the other pictures, then literally rotate the picture. And yes, I really did just rotate the pictures to get these. Okay, uh, so that's how we're going to depict critical cancellation. This is what we're going to draw for horizontal cusps, and this is what we're going to draw for swallowtails. All right, let's look at what happens when F is a circle and T is nothing. And then look at what the positive, negative births and deaths are. And uh, you see that, let's see how to read this. So if we look at the bottom of this picture here, then we read along that and we go from circle to circle. So we're gonna think about that as a cylinder. At the middle level, we have circle goes to nothing. So that's a yarmulke. And then nothing goes to circle. So that's a bowl. And then circle goes to circle. And so this composition, corresponds to an identity on cylinder. Cylinder is a circle cross I. The identity on a cylinder is a cylinder cross I cross I. And so this 
move corresponds to a four dimensional two handle and going backwards also corresponds to a four dimensional two handle. Over here um, at the top, we have nothing. In the middle, we have the birth of a sphere followed by the death, death of a sphere. So that's a three ball. So we go from here to here is a three ball. Then this is another three ball. Uh, we compare that to nothing. The union of the two three balls is a four ball. And so this is either a four dimensional zero handle or a four dimensional four handle. Okay? Groovy, right? Um, in the case of saddles and forks, we get either one and three handles. And what's happening is we're just looking at these handles from different points of view as they're projected into the world that we see. And the glyphography describes how we're seeing those handles as they're projected. All right. Uh, so that's what our triple arrows are. Our triple arrows are handles. And then our uh, quadruple, yeah, the cusps are um, cancellations of handles um, in various forms. Um, critical cancellations uh, are critical cancellations as they should be. Uh, I don't want to say much more about that. Horizontal cusps look like this, and um, they correspond to various ways that you might uh, choose to cancel handles. Swallow tails also are always cool in this scenario. Um, let's look up this column. So we have to go from here to here, there's a birth. To go from here to here, there's a subsequent birth. To go from here to here, there's a saddle between them. And so that's comparable to just going from nothing to a sphere. So that's comparable to a three ball. On the other hand, this is comparable to a three ball. And then an, an exchange of order has occurred here. Um, things look like critical cancellations. This horizontal cusp relation, um, uh, a lot of the Confusing things when you see handle cancellations can be explained really by means of horizontal cusps. Uh, in the case when we, uh, in one of the other columns of that table that I showed, we can let um, the category be labeled by a saddle and then um, the births, deaths, saddles, and forks. Uh, all the situation is indicated here. And this is what happens when you have. Um, uh, uh, critical cancellation, horizontal cusps, and swallowtails. Um, so these are all the four arrows. Obviously, you can't digest this, and obviously, you can't see the iconography here. So uh, you should have a copy of the slides, and uh, you should be able to decipher them um, with the utmost of patience. Um, but it's all there. Okay, so. Let's put everything into an inductive context. How am I doing on time, by the way? Okay, good. Um, well, uh, another quarter of an hour? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be finished before then. Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I forgot to say. Right, when I say hour. great, I don't mean good. Yeah, I, right, you right. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so um, let's label. F and T by binary sequences. And we'll let, uh, to begin with, P and B will be 0 and 1, or not and 1. And F naught will be the identity on naught. F1 will be the identity on 1. T naught will be the composition PB. And T1 will be the composition PB. OK. And then here's the inductive step. So we have generating one arrows, and then we inductively define some two arrows. And the two arrows will be labeled uh, just by putting knots or ones, and they'll be labeled by Fs and Ts. So if we have an identity, the identity is always going to be um, an F. If it's an identity on an F, then it's F naught of that F. If it's the identity on T, then it's F1 of that T. The T's are either going to be PB or P, 
PB. We have identity two arrows. We have generating two arrows, which will um, write like this, and then we'll relabel those identity two arrows by P and B uh, by putting a not or a one with whatever we have have done before. And so again, F not is an identity on F. F one is an identity on T. T not is a PB. T one is a BP. These things have been defined previously. And then uh, we I did define non-identity generating arrows of one higher dimension uh, by letting them go from the Fs to the Ts. The Ps go from the Fs to the Ts. The Bs go from the, um, I need to move you all somehow. I don't know if I can do that. Okay, there we go. Um, sorry, uh, the Bs go from the uh, Ts to the Fs. Okay. So we have, um, excuse me, we have then, for example, we have a T not not X and an F not not X, and we can compare them by means of P's and B's, but if we compare them by P's and B's, then we might as well just write them in this fashion. And then this F not not X, is sort of replaced by here. So this is the inductive step for births and deaths, for positive and negative births and deaths. Uh, this is the inductive step for forks and saddles. And this is the inductive step for cusps. And so here I'm using the same glyphography as I did when I just reintroduced all the notation. Uh, and uh, that's the way things go. Um, we can think about arrows as objects. We can think about two arrows as one arrows. And so when we think about the two arrows and one arrows, we're just replacing the two arrows. We're collapsing the category so that this is now going from F1 to T1. So remember, F not, not is, is F, T is one. And so um, that's what happens. Um, over here, uh, critical cancellation, when you rewrite it in terms of the inductive step, critical cancellation becomes a cuspal relation as you expect it to become. Okay? And, um, okay. Uh, we should have four arrows in this box over here, four pairs of arrows. So we have everything is labeled by not, not, not one, one not, or one, one, and they're P's and B's. And um, they are, uh, yamakas and bowls, either positive and negative, uh, forks or saddles, either positive and negatives. And then um, when we compose those, so if we go around this way, then we go and we compare that with the next level up, then we get bursts of spheres. If we compose in this fashion, and this is one of the reasons I didn't go over that other slide. You see, if we compose, uh, let's see, um, if we compose P followed by P, then we get this hole in the wall and that's comparable to two walls. Um, and uh, so these are some of our, um, uh, some of our uh, fourfolds. I think we have some more on the next page. Yeah, we do. Okay, so we have these other ones over here. And I should have gotten up to eight such things here. And over here, we have 16 of these things. And so that shows you how to sort of generate your arrows up to a certain level. And uh, let's just take a break from that inductive step. You can do this, you get handle theory, you get handle theory for compositions. Uh, and the handle theory is very restricted though. You're actually looking at uh, co-dimension one embeddings in this case. Um, let's talk about classical knots from this higher categorical framework. And so we're gonna start out with one unnamed object. We're gonna take an identity arrow on that object. And then we're going to take three types of double arrows. We'll take a negative, an identity, and a positive double arrow. 
And then um, for these double arrows, we want to be able to remove and insert identities as needed. And so we can always stack the double arrows up into a vertical column, but we're not going to write that as a vertical column. We're actually going to write it as a horizontal co column. And then the triple arrows that we get are exchanges. So we have these eight types of exchanges. We have caps and cups, and the caps and cups correspond to our capital Fs as before. Um, and um, the red and blue dots are double arrows, exchanges, and creations are triple arrows, okay? And let's see. The way you compose triple arrows is uh, you stack them one on top of each other. So this triple composition is the same triple composition of a trefoil, and uh, then this composition of triple arrows, then you could find another multi-category that has similar properties, for example, the category of matrices, and then the uh, Yang-Baxter objects correspond to exchangers, and the axioms are that uh, ex I can't read that. Um, okay, whatever it says. Um, leave it to you to read that. It just means that we have type two moves. So doing followed by not doing is the same. Doing followed by undoing is the same as not doing. Um, change followed by exchange is the same as exchange followed by change, and that gives us the right of Meister type through three move. Change followed by exchange is the same thing as exchange followed by change. But we also have this type of change followed by exchange is exchange followed by change. And from these moves here, diagrammatically, as long as we have zigzag moves, then we can get uh, the psi moves that Lou was talking about. Uh, we'll also put the type 1 moves in as uh, possible axioms, and then uh, we need the zigzag moves uh, together with exchanging distant critical points and exchanges, and that's a description of that particular four category. Okay, so the category of tangles is also a four category. There's a way of combining the two four categories that we said to create surfaces and spaces of five category. Bursts, desks, saddles, and cusps are promoted to being four arrows. Reitemeister moves are four arrows. Roseman moves or the moving moves are five isomorphisms. And uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you. Um, let me undo you all. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to do this. Um, un, unmute all. Okay, right. So clap for Scott. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, that was uh, extremely interesting. Um, are there any questions? No. Well, just 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 a quick question. So, when you say tricategorial and four category, do you mean a globular set with composition, or do you, are you actually using some uh, notion of tricategorial and four category? I'm. I will be very unspecific about that. Other than saying that I will require globular compositions. I will allow skew compositions, uh, and skew compositions have to have the property that um, you have well-defined sources and targets at all the lower levels. Um, so you have to be careful about that. And um, I did say things were a sesqui category at one point, and the reason was that I don't want, want to allow horizontal compositions because I just... I can't deal with them. So um, I don't know what the correct categorical terminology is in this case. It's certainly not always a sesquic category. It's like a 
2.5 category, a 3.5 category, but every category is staggered in that way, in that I, there can't be any sort of horizontal composition. Are there any more questions, comments? Okay, well. Uh, I'd like to make one comment. Everything oh, yeah. was made, yeah, everything was made with Tixi. Tixi. Yeah, T-I-K-Z picture. Oh. So that's, that's all tech code there. Wow. So I'll make and it that's impressive. That. T I K S. T I K Z. Z. Okay. Well, does anybody else know that? Tigs. No. Very popular these days. Is it? Yeah, I think so. A very nice package to make commutative diagrams and. Okay, well, when I send out this, um, this uh, video, I'll put a link to Tix, uh, which I suppose is free. Yeah, it's just a tech package. Um, yeah. I would call it TigZ, because when you're typing these things in, you want to type in begin TigZ picture. And if you right. pronounce it that way, you'll remember how it's spelled. Do you have to use it with Linux or can you use it with plain tech? Oh, it's just a bit. No, you use it with LaTeX. It's right. a LaTeX pa package. Right. Um, uh, uh, if you want the code for the glyphs, contact me and I'll tell you what they are. I'll send them to you. Okay. Right. Well. Sorry. So when is gonna be the book available, Scott? Uh, I don't know. I just sent it to the publisher, and uh, the publisher has to decide whether uh, it's there. But I'll be happy to send you an advance copy, Carmen. Thank you. Okay. So the next talk is on Tuesday, and it's given by Zhao. Yeah. Do you want to say anything? Like uh, how I pronounce your name correctly? Uh, that, that's the hardest bit. Zhuang. Yeah. Yeah. I, I Sorry? Don't think. Zhuang. Zhuang. Well, close enough. Well, Zhuang. Well, <laughs> I was just doing the slides. I just make a, a very introductory uh, talk on cross modules and uh, how multiple two types of uh, not complements of knotted surfaces, and I'll try to keep it very, very simple. But I think it will go on the lines of the bipedal talks. Were given. Is, is this Tuesday or Friday next week? It's Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is Tuesday. Uh, um, any other volunteers to give a talk or Sam? Uh, I'll send you an email. Yeah? Yes. That sounds good. Yeah. Sergey? No? No, probably no. Not not at this moment. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Sir, well, if, you, if you get the idea that you'd like to give a talk, let us know. We'll, we'll yeah. fit you in. Yeah. You don't have to say it now. Anytime. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, well, thanks again for everybody and I'll stop recording now.